Veterans Day, November 11th, 2012, a day in which we thank and remember all those who have served. It is also a national day of prayer for persecuted Christians throughout the world. And so today, as we are thanking veterans, we need to keep those who are in less free countries in prayer. When Dwight D. Eisenhower was president from 1953 to 1961, he received a letter from eight-year-old Keith Aiken of Trumbull, Connecticut. Kevin wrote, after listening to the news about the Cold War, I am worried about the people in the world. And thinking it over, I have a plan. Get all the leaders together who want fight, who want war, put them in a ring, and let them fight it out. There are veterans who have served during peacetime, those who have served during aggressive fighting, and I bet all would agree that rather than having wars, wouldn't it be better to just take all those who disagree with one another, put them in a ring, and let them fight it out? Matthew 24, 6 says, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still not to come. Many Bible commentators believe that this was referring to 70 AD when Rome invaded Jerusalem and tore down the temple. But we can look over the last 2,000 years and be very much aware that every time you look at a newspaper, or every time you turn on the news, there is another rumor of a war or another country invading another country. General Sherman once said, if you don't know the horrible aspects of war, I've been through two wars and I know. I've seen cities and homes in ashes. I've seen thousands of men lying on the ground, their dead faces looking up at the skies. I tell you, war is hell. I don't question General Sherman's feelings about these conflicts. But from a Christian perspective, we must say that war may be hellish, but it is not hell. There is something worse than war. There is something worse than the conflicts that we have in the world, and that is when people have rejected Jesus Christ. Nothing is more horrible than their final destination. Some time ago, a poem was published in national newspapers. This is how it reads. It is a veteran, not a preacher, who has given us freedom of religion. It is a veteran, not a reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It is the veteran, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us freedom to assemble. It is the veteran, not the lawyer, who has given us the right to a fair trial. It is the veteran, not the politician, who has given us the right to vote. And it is the veteran who salutes the flag, who serves under the flag. Today we honor all veterans, but we must also take the time to honor those who are being persecuted in other countries. There are three things that every veteran knows that also every Christian needs to know. That is, obey the commander, engage the enemy, and fight to the end. Some time ago, a very egotistical Air Force major was promoted to colonel, and he got a new office. The first morning he was in his new office, an airman knocked on the door and asked to speak with him. The colonel, feeling an urge to impress the young airman, picked up his phone and began talking. Yes, General, thank you. I will pass that information along to the President this afternoon. Yes, goodbye, sir. Then turning to the airman, he barked, and what do you want? Nothing important, said the airman. I just came to hook up your telephone. <laughs> there is real authority, and there is wannabe authority. There are people who actually have real authority in this world, and there are people who just out of ego strength, or out of selfishness or ambition, impose their authority on other people. We recently had an election, and politics aside, we elected a commander-in-chief of our military, every veteran, every 
person in the military knows that the buck stops at the White House, it is the President of the United States who has the absolute authority over the military. 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. The Bible actually likens those who follow Jesus Christ as soldiers, as somebody who is in a different way of doing things. When I went into, the, into basic training in October of 1981, it was a different world. Uh, they cut off all my hair and they told me to wear these clothes that were like everybody else's. And if I were to walk off base, for example, and try to go back to my old life, they would arrest me and bring me back. There is a sense that when you become a Christian, you leave aside, you put aside the things of this world. And you focus like a military person on the work of Jesus Christ. Now, the president is the commander-in-chief of our military, but Jesus Christ is our commander-in-chief. And we must follow what he says over and above what other people say. That creates a, a difficult situation, for there are people who live in countries where it is illegal to pray, where it is illegal to carry a Bible, where it is a capital offense. They will kill you for reading a Bible in public like we just did. And they must realize that their leadership in their government, their religious leaders, their political leaders, take a second space, a second seat to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we live in a country that is free, we must realize that if the government ever does go a bit sideways with regard to the rule of what God wants us to do, uh, we have a choice to make. Will we follow Jesus Christ? Will we continue to study our Bibles even though it's not allowed? Will we continue to pray in public even though it's dangerous? And that is a decision that every Christian needs to make. There are those who believe that persecution is, is a purifying element because it forces people to finally choose once and for all who they're going to follow. It is, it is not... I doubt if you would find a lackadaisical, cultural, non-involved Christian in Indonesia. If you're a Christian in Indonesia, you're putting your life on the line, and it's got to mean something. Ephesians 1.22 says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Jesus Christ is in charge of us. And we can choose this day who we will serve, either Jesus Christ or the government or our own selfish ambition and our own selfish ego. Luke 6.46 says, Why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? Jesus, as the commander-in-chief, brings about, we call, uh, ask for respect, and we need to do what he says. Shortly after joining the Navy, the new recruit asked his officer for a pass so he could attend a wedding. The officer gave him the pass, but informed the young man that he would have to be back by 7 p.m. Sunday. You don't understand, sir, said the recruit. I'm in the wedding. No, you don't understand, the officer shot back. You're in the Navy. <laughs> when that ship sails, got to be on it. Secondly, we need to engage the enemy. Uh, it is easy to disagree with people in church. We come here and we're all nice and friendly and happy together and if we can find something we don't like, it's very easy to complain. Uh, many years ago, 
a 18 year old stole a bicycle and he was cutting in and out of traffic and then went into the neighborhoods and two police cars from two different directions were following him and when they turned the corner they ran into each other the police cars ran into each other and the bicyclists just went on the result was a fist fight between the two officers because they blamed each other for letting the stolen bike get away. We need to not fight with one another. We need to lift up one another and not let the conflicts of the world come into the church. The Bible says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Ultimately, when we are fighting against difficult times, when people in other countries are under governments that don't allow them to be Christians, it is spiritual forces, it is evil spiritual forces that are behind these things. We need to realize that if somebody in a church offends us, if somebody in a church steps on our toes, so to speak, if somebody in a church really hurts us, that there are spiritual forces at work that Satan would like nothing more for this church and every church to have so many fights that we split and that we break apart and that we destroy the loving community that is here. 1 Peter 5 8 says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion searching for someone to devour. So I need to be self-controlled, I need to be self-aware, realizing that Satan is out there everywhere, basically. That we don't fight with one another, we fight with the devil. Now I am not one who says that we need to look for the devil under a rug. I'm not one who says that everything bad that happens is a spiritual attack. Um, if, for example, I get a flat tire and I'm late to a Bible study or I'm late to church because of the flat tire, I wouldn't immediately say that was an attack of Satan. But Satan can use that to get me angry and to get me so that I come to church in a mood where I'm not willing to glorify God. I want to punish the tire maker. I want to punish the road for having that nail in it. I want, I'm just angry. And Satan can use that in a spiritual way to point me in a direction that church no longer has a meaning for me in that day. When we talk about spiritual warfare, we need to realize that Christian spiritual warfare is a bit more passive. In spiritual warfare, our first weapon is prayer. Um, we don't go and confront Satan. We pray for his influence. We pray that God will be glorified. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to study the Bible. I'm not going to be able to recognize what is happening in the world. I'm not going to be able to recognize how Satan has influenced things without knowing the Bible and without knowing the true power of God. We need church attendance. You cannot grow as a Christian in the proper way by ignoring the gathering of other Christians. There are some people who have been saved from an early age. Um, I find many people that I've talked to who have moved into this area uh, they were saved in another part of California or another state, and they got married. They moved here because of work. They had children, and they got too busy for church. And after a while, the lack of church attendance the, will lead to lack of Bible study, will lead to lack of prayer. And I, I ask people who tell me that story, uh, do they know where their Bible is? A lot of them say, well, it's in one of those boxes in the garage. You know, they packed it up to move and never unpacked it, and they've been living in San Lorenzo for nine years. Um, 
So never really unpack that Bible. An old deacon who used to pray every Wednesday night at the prayer meeting, he concluded his prayer saying, And Lord, clean all the cobwebs out of my life. Got to be too much for one of the fellows in the prayer meeting. He had heard the old deacon one time too often. And so when a man made that prayer, the fellow jumped to his feet and shouted, Lord, Lord, don't do it. Instead, kill the spider. Sometimes we have cobwebs in our brain and we need to realize that there are other causes, there are other issues. And being in your Bible, being in your church, helps discover those. A fourth way is giving. Giving to your church, giving to persecuted Christians ministries, giving to veterans organizations, taking part of your earnings and giving them to a cause that you believe in does wonderful things for your spirit, for your emotional, for your humility now realize that you can be a tool of God to bring good to other people by giving. By serving, uh, doing something in a church, serving God is a great way to give your time. Uh, when we give our time and we get to serve God, then God can activate and expand your spiritual gift and God can show you a purpose and a meaning that you have in the church that you cannot get on your own. And lastly, we need to love one another. Uh, you can't love one another if you're never around another. Uh, you can look at others on the TV, I suppose, and say, I love them. But to actually see people face to face as we do Sunday mornings here shows that you matter. And when the love of God transfers from person to person in a hug, in a handshake, then God is alive in this building. God is alive and His Spirit Amen. is working Amen. amongst us. That is the evidence that we have. Remember, once again, 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, self-control and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to bow. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. When we pray, we study the Bible, we need to remember those in the other parts of the world who may not have it as fortunate as us. The third aspect of a veteran or an active Christian is a fight to the end. Jesus said, all men will hate you because of me, but he who stand firm to the end will be saved. There is coming a time, and it is here in many countries where just uttering the name of Jesus will get you in jail. Uh, the great way to get back at somebody you don't like in Iran is to go to the police and say, I heard that guy praying. You know, and they will, no questions asked, go and arrest them. You know, and then you can take their job or whatever. You can actually use the government to get rid of your enemies by declaring that they are Christians, which is an interesting way of doing it. Matthew 24 says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Gentleman Jim Corbett was a heavyweight boxing person in the 19th century, and they asked him once how he could win. And he said, I always fight one more round. When my feet are so tired that I have to shuffle back to the center of the ring, I fight one more round. When my arms are so tired that I can hardly lift my hands to guard myself, I fight one more round. When my nose is bleeding, my eyes are black, and I am so tired that I wish my opponent would crack me on the jaw and put me to sleep, I fight one more round. Remembering that the man who fights one more round is never whipped. We can fight one more round. And if we can fight one more round, 
then we will never give up. Because when it seems the hardest, we fight one more round. We are called to fight in a war and not to sit around and gripe about the things we don't like. Uh, there are political attitudes that have invaded the church and that people are, are bringing into the church and decide to complain about what's happening in the government, what's happening with your taxes, what's happening with an election, and that becomes the focus of their Christianity. But as I said before, our ultimate en enemy is the evil that is in the world. And we need to pray and study our Bible and realize that we can live as truly functional, forgiven Christians day by day. And it doesn't matter what happens in Sacramento. It doesn't matter what happens in Washington. Paul was a Roman citizen. And when he was really getting going on the missionary, missionary trips, he got noticed by government officials. And they questioned him. And they said, we find nothing wrong with this guy. He's actually preaching love. But his response was, I appeal to Caesar. The way it worked in the Roman government is that any Roman citizen could request to be judged by Caesar. Now, Paul didn't want to go to Rome and stand before Caesar so that he could be proved right. He wanted a free trip to Rome and a free audience with the emperor so that he could convert him to Jesus Christ, so that he could witness to him, so that he could convert the entire government and the whole Senate to Jesus Christ and change the face of the Roman Empire and change the face of the world. Um, God had a different plan, and that was to put Nero into power. And Paul never had an opportunity to meet Nero. Um, he was arrested and killed before that. But his idea, his thought was, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he could convert the entire government so that they would become loving, compassionate, God-centered people. And when we sit around and say, I hate this policy or I hate this about politics, maybe we can turn it around and say, I'm going to pray that every single person in Washington, D.C. gets saved. That every, per every person who serves in the government in Sacramento gets saved. And not just lip service salvation, but real, honest, true, totally sold out to Jesus Christ salvation. And consider what a change that would make in policy, what a change that would make in politics. We need to be people who fight with prayer, who fight with Bible study. And in that way, the world can be changed. 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. That's what Paul said. And perhaps that is something that we should seek. John Stuart Mill, one of my favorite early American authors, he uh, died in 1873, and he wrote a lot about liberty and democracy. And he said, war is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. The decay and degraded state of moral and patriotic feelings is much worse. The person who has nothing for which he is willing to fight is a miserable creature. We need to fight for our Christianity. We need to fight for our country. We need to fight for our freedom. God bless the USA. Amen. God bless our veterans. And God bless the veterans of the Christian faith. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, today we Honor and remember and ask your blessings upon the veterans. We ask your blessing upon those who are in other countries who cannot worship as we do, who cannot meet in a beautiful building as we do, who have to meet in basements and in closets. Lord, I pray that you will keep them safe, and I pray that a 
revival will sweep through the governments of these countries that disallow Christianity. I pray that your spirit will descend upon our government and upon the governments all around the world. That the world may once again turn toward you, that they may realize who you are, and that the faith of Jesus Christ may be the banner that is waved above every government house. Lord, I pray now for your strength for those who need you, your healing for those who are sick. And I ask your blessing upon the remainder of the day, especially for those who have served in the armed forces. Thank you for all this and ask it through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our